Lord, open our eyes that we would behold wonderful things from your truth. Open our ears that we would hear that still small voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. And open the spiritual eyes of our hearts that we would see a God in heaven who loves us and longs to be gracious to us. And I pray all of this in the gracious, beautiful, majestic name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen. Please have a seat. Listen to this quote that I found in my preparation for this message. It was, says, The darkness grows thicker around us and godly servants of the Most High become rarer and more rare. Sin and licentiousness are rampant throughout the world and we live like pigs. Like wild beasts devoid of all reason. But a voice will soon be heard thundering forth, Behold, the bridegroom comes. God will not be able to bear this wicked world much longer, but will come with that dreadful day and chastise the scorners of his word. Sounds like something that could have been written yesterday, but it was actually written by the great reformer Martin Luther 500 years ago. Some things haven't changed much. But you know, one of the things that has changed, sadly, especially in the church, especially in the church in the West, is that we have shied away from talking about God's judgment because it just doesn't feel very good. It doesn't feel very friendly. It doesn't seem very loving. So what we've done is we have, we have pastors of some of the largest churches in America who have actually just said hell does not really exist. I don't know how you can have Jesus without that. Or what they've said is, well, you know what? We need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament because, because that God is kind of like our crazy uncle that, that you know, we, we all have to have over for dinner but we, every now and then, but we don't really want to show him off to our friends. So let's just get rid of the Old Testament, which there's a massive problem with that because Jesus quoted the Old Testament all the time. And then there's even a group that just says, well, you know what? I'm going to take it even further. The only words that are really the ones we need to pay attention to in the Bible are the red letters. If you have a red letter Bible, those are the words that Jesus spoke. Because I think it's so important that we set the table for what we're going to see in Revelation. I want you to turn, before we go to Revelation, to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew's at the beginning of your New Testament, so it's about two-thirds of the way through your Bible. Just keep turning to the right. This is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John get to Matthew, and I want to show you some of these red letters. If you have a red letter Bible, or your Bible app is a red letter Bible, then you're going to see these words are in red, which means Jesus spoke them right after he gets done sharing a parable of the soils. Some of you may be familiar with that. He says this. I'm going to pick it up in verse 24. Jesus presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his, so he's talking about the kingdom, the kingdom now, the kingdom to come. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy, that's an allusion to Satan, and so came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, which is fruit, go and bear much fruit, that's the fruit that wheat bears, grain, then the tares become evident also. The slaves of the landowner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then do, do we have tares? And he said to them, All an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us to go and pull out and pull them out? Verse 29. But he said, No, for while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat also. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to be burned, but then gather the wheat into my barn. Because that's Jesus talking. Now, if you're not getting the reference there, turn to our invocation passage. Go to Revelation, all the way to the right in your Bible. Last book of the Bible, Revelation 14. And let's just be really clear about what Jesus is saying. I'm just going to read verses 14 through 16. Jeff just read them a few minutes ago. It says this in Revelation 14, 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like the son of man holding a, a golden crown on his, and on his head, uh, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, 
Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then he sat down in the cloud. Who, who sat down in the clouds swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Guys, who's the he? Jesus. Right? Jesus did not. Jesus was not averse to the judgment of God, and we should not be either. Right? The bottom line is the gospel is only the gospel if there is actually judgment and there is actually hell. But here's the truth. The God, God does not long to be wrathful. And we're going to see that today. But he is just. Right? And for him to be just, he has to, just, he has to pr practice justice. And he does that two different ways. And we're going to see both of them today. Today's message is called, Our Sins Poured Out on All the World. And when I say our, what I mean is humanity's sins poured out on all the world through seven bowls. And what we're going to see, what, the question we're going to ask today is, what is with the wrath of God? What is with the wrath of God? The short answer, I'll just let you in on it. The short answer is, what is with the wrath of God? Our sin is what is with the wrath of God. God doesn't want to be wrathful, but he has to be just. Because that's who he is. And guys, we want him to be that way. Get this. We want, we want, don't we? Do we not want our earthly judge, judges to be just? Right? We, we do. So why would we not want a God of all the universe to be just also? Here's the, we, everybody here, unless you're just a psychopath, like Charles Manson, right? And I'm thinking none of you are. Everybody here wants justice done. Here's our problem as, as, as fallen creatures. We want to draw the line. We want to draw the line by which the justice should fall. But to do that, if you're God, then all you're doing is keeping score. And that's what we tend to do. And that's why we want to draw the line. Well, I'm better than that person, or we're, this group's better than that group, so these people are in and the, these people are out. That's not how God works. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If, if, if we were going to just draw the line on, on who's in and who's out, everyone's out. But we got to get past this idea that, oh man, you know, we, 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 we got to stop talking about the justice of God because it just doesn't feel very loving. Because just practically speaking, we want justice. So we should want a God who is just. And he is. He is the God that he is. So let's pick it up in verse chapter 15. We've got a lot of ground to cover this morning. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 15 and talk about what is with the wrath of God. And we're going to answer it through, through the three chapters we're going to look at today. A God worthy of all worship. So look at chapter 15, verse 1. It says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. Now, remember, we've seen seven seals, and then we saw seven trumpets, and we ended up at the seventh trumpet brings these seven bowls, and these seven bowls are going to get poured out in succession, just like the seals were broken, just like the trumpets were, were blown, and now we're going to see these seven bowls poured out. But I love how he says, because the wrath of God is finished, right? Just like what we talked about. So keep that in the back of your mind. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished, because that part of the wrath of God was finished on Jesus Christ. But what are the people of God doing at this point? Look at, what's, look at what's going on. We're getting a glimpse of heaven now. It says, I saw something like the sea of glass fixed with fire and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number and his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of gold. And they sang a song of Moses, a bondservant of God and, song, and, the, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways. King of the nations, who will not fear our Lord and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all the nations come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. So now what's going on in heaven is that we get this glimpse. Of, and, and we've seen this over and over throughout Revelation. They are doing what in heaven right now? Worshiping. Right? They're worshiping specifically through song. Some people say that you know, the New Testament doesn't really talk a lot about um, singing in church. and it, it seems like singing is a fairly important thing that we're going to be doing for all eternity. Remember what John Newton wrote in his um, classic hymn, Amazing Grace, 
when we've been there 10,000 years, bright and shiny as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we just begun. Right? The, the idea that we are going to be together worshiping God in eternity is just a truth that we have seen throughout this book in Revelation. But these people are worshiping because they have, le- just like anybody that's truly a worshiper of God, they've left their wants behind, including even the want to have a peaceful life, even a want to have their own life preserved, so that they could worship. Jim Elliott said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. That's what these people are experiencing. They've given up everything, including their lives, and are now in the presence of God and can never lose that. Pick it up in verse 5. It says, After these things I looked in the temple of the tabernacle, t- and, t- and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels who had seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures, you remember those from the past messages that we talked about, um, it says that these are the ones that kind of are coordinating what's going on on the earth. These four living creatures came out of the temple, clothed in linen. I'm sorry, um, sorry, verse 7. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke and the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues and the seven angels were finished. And there's a great illusion there. You see this in Exodus where, where um, Moses in the tabernacle, it says Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle because the glory of God filled the tabernacle of God. You see this when Solomon finishes the temple of God on the Temple Mount 500, 600 years later when, he's, when, when the temple is finished and the presence of God fills the temple and it says and the priests were not able to enter the temple. That same thing is a, we're getting a glimpse of that same thing going on here in heaven. But what we're seeing is, is as the temple of God, as God's people together are being filled with God's glory, the wrath of God is being, le- is being poured out. It's almost as if he's going, you know what, the wrath is out of here, the glory is filling it. Again, keep that in mind as we keep moving through. The other thing I want you to remember is, is as we're going through chapters 14, or 15, 16, 17, and 18 next Sunday, Lord willing. These are not chronological. These are all happening simultaneously. As the wrath of God is being poured out, they are worshiping in heaven. All of this is going on at once. So ultimately, what is, ha- what is with the wrath of God? Justice is what is with the wrath of God. Right? There has to be justice done. He is gathering. It's, it's almost as if what, he, what God is doing in this scene is he is gathering together all of the rebellion of the world that was not satisfied on the cross of Christ, and we're going to come back there quite a few times today, and he is going to gather all that together into one place down here on the earth so that he can just deal with it all at once. As, as he's been telling this story that we've been talking about for, since, the middle, since the first of June, and he is dri- God has been telling the story since Genesis, he is driving to this climactic point where he is gonna, God is going to make right Once and for all, all that was made wrong in the garden. When we rebelled and continue to rebel against him, the only way out of that rebellion, the only way to fix what was broken is two ways. And you're going to hear this over and over because it's so important we get this. Is either through those who come to faith in what happened at the cross or what we're about to see in the next chapter. Who reject the free gift of grace. Because God doesn't have a choice to be just, he can't just go, I'm going to pretend like I don't see that. And, every, and, and I get that, wait a minute, if he's really loving and, we, and our minds start racing with all these, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, and, and just put it really practically. What would you think about an earthly judge that did that? What would you think about an earthly judge that just let a child predator go? Well, you know, okay, I get that. They should be punished. Ah, see, there's that line drawing. We're drawing the line. Where do you stop? Hitler. Six million Jews. Oh, for sure he's in. Somebody kills ten people. Are they in or out? One person, are they in or out? Hey, let's up the ante a little bit, Jesus says. If you look at your brother with hatred in your heart, you are a murderer. Everyone's out. (laughs) Right? So where are we drawing the line? The answer is the line is drawn at the cross of Jesus Christ. 
The cross, the wrath of God, we're going to see chapter 16, we're going to start seeing these seven bowls poured out. God's collected the wrath of God. He's going to pour them out on the world, collect it all into one place. And that wrath is poured out only two places. It was poured out, it, the Bible says, the Gospels are clear, the wrath of God was poured out onto his own son. Guys, this is the part I don't understand about the people who are trying to hide from the judgment of God. Why are we trying to soften up God when he is the one who provided the instrument of, his, of the propitiation of his wrath? In other words, he's not only just, he is the justifier. He, yeah, okay, I, I have to punish rebellion because I'm a good father. I cannot let my kids get away with whatever they want. But oh, by the way, I am also going to provide the instrument free of charge to anybody who wants to escape that wrath. By, by giving my own son in that place. That's one of the places the wrath of God was poured out. Isaiah 53 says that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement of us all fell on him. By his beating, we were made whole. And yet all of us have gone astray. Right? All of us have wanted our own way. That, that last part of Isaiah 53, 6 is our problem. We want our way. I use this analogy a lot here where I, where I put up a whiteboard and I, have, I write down my sins on this whiteboard and I talk about how in Colossians chapter 2 when he says, when, when, when Paul says that God took away the record of judgment against us, having annihilated it, and this is important for these two ways the wrath of God are, poor, are, are, are dealt with. Because the difference with the cross and what we're going to see with the bowls is, is at the cross, all of our sins, past, present, and future, according to Colossians 2, have been destroyed. God is not keeping, the sins we're going to see poured out in these bowls are not believer sins that God, that God forgave but he hung on to. The minute you come to faith in Christ, he has forgotten every sin you will ever commit in, in his grand sovereignty. He just chooses to. But those that reject him, those sins are being collected. And now we're going to see that those sins are poured out. And that's the second way the wrath of God is poured out. It's poured out onto those who, who, are, who are basically thumbing their nose and shaking their fist at God. He's saying, guys, all of you have rebelled. I'm giving you the way out, but if you choose not, if you're just like, you know what, I don't want any part of that, you are slapping him in the face and saying, you know what, he hung his son on the cross for nothing, but I get ahead of myself. Some of you might be sitting here right now going, you know what, I'm not rejecting God, I believe in God, I'm just rejecting Jesus. But ultimately, can you see the affront that is to God? Paul says, it, Paul says as much in, in Galatians chapter 2. For I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And this life I live in faith, I live by, this life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So he's saying the only way I can live right with God is by believing in Jesus Christ. And then he finishes the thought, Galatians 2.21, I don't nullify the grace of God. I don't spit on the grace of God. I don't, I don't thumb my nose at the grace of God. I don't shake my fist at the grace of God. Because if righteousness, if being right with God could come from simply being a good person, doing good things, being better than that dude, then Christ died for nothing. Then God sacrificed his son on the cross for nothing. It's a historical fact that Jesus was, came here, lived, was beaten severely and crucified. And if we think that somehow we can escape judgment by just being better, we are saying all of that happened for no reason. I just can't believe that God would do that. So a God worthy of worship faced with a rebellious and unrepentant people is, has a choice. Right? I either become unjust, in which case anything goes, literally anything goes, or I practice my justice. Here's the truth. The greatest judgment God can place on us is letting us have our own way. The greatest judgment God can place on your heart is letting you just have your own way. Because ultimately that ends in destruction. 
Whether that's, guys, and, and that's true even for us as believers. When, when we're struggling through that, like I talked about last week, that moment of worship, do I choose his way or do I choose what I want even as a sealed believer? Because we all still have those struggles, right? It's this, the, the worst thing is for us to choose our way. And God to go, you know what, I'm going to let, and he does that sometimes. He's like, I'm going to let you see how that, you, you run that, down that road for a while, Doug, and see how that works for you. But that's not his heart. So faced with a, a rebellious and unrepentant people, he, he's, he's got to do something now. He's got to do something. Right? Look at verse two, or look at chapter 16, verse 1. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the, on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel came and poured out his bowl on all the earth. Now one, I just want to stop right there and say, he could have poured all seven out at once. If, so, so keep that in mind. There's, he is not obligated to, to pour out these bowls one at a time. He is intentionally giving people time, even now, even in the midst, he's giving people time to repent, to believe in Jesus Christ. He doesn't just dump them all out at once. Why? Because what, what did Peter tell us? 2 Peter 3, 9. That God is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. If you're sitting here today and you're not his, would you please become his so we can all go home? Because he's waiting. Right? His heart, guys, here's God's heart. He longs to be gracious to you. He waits on high to have, he is not up there going, I just cannot wait to punish these people. That's not God. He's going, guys, I'm giving you every single chance. I'm waiting and I'm holding back these angels that just want to end this. I'm holding them back because I want you to come to me. Right? Ezekiel says this. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord, rather that they would turn from their ways and live? But guys, this, because he's just, he has to execute judgment. So here it goes. Look at the rest of verse 2 and on. And it became a loathsome and malignant sore. So the first bowl is poured out and it becomes a loathsome and, 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 and malignant sore. And the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image... The second angel poured out his bowl into the earth, and it became blood like, the, like a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Then the third bowl is poured out into the rivers and the springs of water, and they become blood. So, so just all we're seeing, we've seen all of this before in the, in the trumpets, right, in the seals, but he's just, he's just, he's just, uh, he's, he is shaking the world awake harder and harder, going, wake up, wake up, wake up, because the time is about to end, and time is short, and get, get with the program here, people. And then he says, and then it says, oh, and then it says, and, and I heard the angel of the water saying, righteous are you who are and who were, O holy one, because you judge these things, for they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Wait a minute, how is an altar speaking? Keep your finger right where we're at. Turn just a few pages to chapter 6, verse 9. I, want to I think it's important that we get why all this, part of why all this is happening. Chapter 6, verse 9 of Revelation says this. We're back, this is, now we're all the way back to the seal. So we passed up the trumpets. It says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar... The souls of those who'd been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. Those are the people that are speaking in, now back in chapter 16, verse 7. They're saying, yes, O Lord, God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. But guys, get this. Look at, what's ha look at what happens. In, you keep going in verses 8 through 11. The fourth angel poured out his bowl in the sun, and it was, it was taken, um, and it had been given, um, I'm sorry, upon and his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and, and they blasphemed the name of the Lord, who was the power, who has the power over all the plagues. And, and get, but get, guys, look how hard the human heart is. In the midst of everything we've seen already, and what we're just seeing today in these bowls, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Man, they are locking their jaw and digging in their heels. And that was me for 24 years. 
Then the fifth angel pours out his bowl on the, throne, on the throne of the beast and the kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain and they blasphemed God of the heaven because of their pain and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. Guys, through all of this, there is still no repentance. And yet, ah, we blame God. Why? He is, I mean, he is doing everything he can to say, wake up. Wake up, world. He's still, he's still doing it now. Wake up, world. And, and yet, this, most of the world has the same response they had that we've seen here. They did not repent. Why? Because we want what we want. It's been our problem from the beginning. Guys, we are what caused this. This is not God's fault. We rebelled in the garden. We part, we, each of us partner in that rebellion every day. If you don't think you do, there's your first problem. Come to him with that. But each of us rebel against a God who made you because he loves you and he wants a relationship with you that we broke. He didn't break it. And yet, even in the garden, do you remember what he does? He doesn't go to them and say, how dare you not obey me? He says, where are you? He comes after them. And he's still coming after us today. And what we're seeing in these bowls is he is coming after us. So just come to him. Just come. Don't be like I was for 24 years. Arrogant. I'm still prideful, but just don't be this lockjawed, dig your heels in. I know best. I don't need God. I'm just telling you, that is, that is the deceit of the enemy. Because I'm way over time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just tell you that, that verses 12 through 21 are then the last bowls are, are God's preparation for what is coming at the battle of Armageddon. In fact, at the end of verse 16, you see it says, and they gathered together in a place which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddon. That's, that's what, where we get the phrase Armageddon. It's the final battle that we're going to see in the coming chapters. But guys, I want to show you something. That I think it's important for us to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Right? Because there's a lot here just in this chapter before we finish up with chapter 17. So again, keep your finger here. Go to the Gospel of John. So it's, it's towards the beginning of your New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 3. John is the same John who wrote Revelation, right? The, the Apostle John wrote Revelation. This is John's gospel. Look at John starting in 316, probably the most well-known verse in all the Bible. But I wish when we quote John 316, we would finish the thought. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his, his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's what a lot of those, proud, those people that are doing away with hell, doing away with judgment, that they're going to claim verse 17 and say, see, Jesus isn't about judgment. I don't know what they do with Matthew 13 and a zillion other passages Jesus talked about. However, let's keep going. He who believes in him, verse 18, is not judged. He, so those of us that come to Christ, are, are, we are, the wrath has been appeased at the cross. He who does not believe in him has been judged already. Because in God's sovereignty, he knows. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and that men loved the darkness. Guys, get that. That's what we're seeing happen in chapter 16 of Revelation. The light came into the world and, and, and God is trying to wake them up and the, the human response, apart from the Holy Spirit, is lock your jaw, dig your heels in. I'm going to say no to God because I'm God. And you might not say that out loud, but I'm telling you that's your heart condition if you're not in Christ. It says, For everyone who does evil hates the light, and do, does not come into the light, for, their, for they fear their deeds will be exposed. But those who practice truth come to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought of God. Guys, we are to be living proof that the gospel is true. Our, we are to be his light to a world that is going to experience this if they don't come to faith in Christ. So what is with the wrath of God? A God worthy of all worship, faced with a rebellious 
and unrepentant people must deal with those who choose to worship what they want. Guys, and, and we know this. I mean, just think about parenting. What do you think of when you're in Walmart and you see the kid who's out of control and the parent is just giving them what they want anyway? What, what is your attitude towards that parent? You're trying to have a nice conversation at dinner and the kids at the table next to you are out of control. What is your attitude about that parent? Why would we have a different attitude about God? Why would we expect God to allow his children to do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, and not have consequences? Those children end up rotten. And we know it. And I'm going to avoid going off on that any further. <laughs> Look at verse chapter 17, and we're just going to touch on a couple of verses here, and then I'm going to pick it up in 17 next week for 17 and 18. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls, came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And that's what we're going to talk about next week. With whom the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. This is, this is alluding to, and in, the, and in the coming verses that we're going to look at next week, this is alluding to the world system that has been, that as, as all of the stuff we're reading about is coming together, the world system being controlled by the beast and being led by the Antichrist are coming together in a one world government, one world economy, one world religion, and that is the harlot. And we're going to see how God deals with that harlot next week. But again, in the interest of time, I'm just going to leave it there. I, I want to read one more verse to you, or part of one verse. Look at verse 3. I'd just like to be John here. So this angel comes up with this bowl of wrath. You're like, I hope he's not pouring it out on me, because I just saw what it did to everybody else. And it says, and he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. So he's about to give John, and this is where we're going to leave it for today, he's about to give John more prophetic scripture. Here's what's coming. Now guys, here's what you have to remember. Prophecy is, is given, pro prophetic scripture is given to save sinners, to wake people up to Christ. It's given to sanctify saints. Those of us that have already come to Christ, it's to remind us to live for him. It is not given to satisfy our curiosity. I said it every week so far in the last four or five weeks. I'm going to say it again this week. Do not get bogged down in the details and miss the big picture. Don't get bogged down in trying to figure out who the harlot is and whether they're walking around on the planet right now or who the, who the Antichrist is and whether they're alive. I'm just telling you, don't. That's not, not, here's why. That's not why God gave it to John. He gave it to John so that we would live ready. That's the bottom line. So that we would live ready. Our sinful hearts want to know exactly when I really need to be ready. No, we need to be ready today. That's what Jesus said. You have no idea when I'm coming back. So every minute of every day, keep your lamp lit. That's what he wants us to do. As the music team is coming up, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. So they're going to come up, and we're going to just have a time of response, and it's a prayer Sunday and a fellowship Sunday, and I, and I get that this is really heavy stuff for both of those. Um, but here's what I want to ask you, because... This was, so, this was so me, and, and, and I can even in my heart now, I can start to go, but God, I, I don't want you to be that way. Why? That's the question. Why don't you want your God to be that way? Is it, what, or maybe you're just saying, you know what, I don't want any part of that God. I don't want a part of that God who is judgmental. I don't want a God who is, who is just because I don't see it as just because I want to decide what justice is. Right? Maybe you're sitting here with the question of the day. Like, what's with the wrath of God? Like, why, what's with this wrathful God that you Christians, you biblical Christians are talking about? The answer is justice. Right? The answer is righteousness. Guys, the bottom line is our sin is what is with the wrath of God. And, and, and a just God has to deal with sin or he is no longer just. And there are two ways he's doing it. 
He is the one who provided the instrument through which his justice could be poured out on his son, Jesus Christ. He is the one who was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Guys, get this. It was the Father's will to crush him. Why? Guys, think, just, th- you, you've heard that before. It's Isaiah 53. It was the Father's good pleasure to crush Jesus Christ. Why? Because God knows what's coming. Because do, do you understand the Do you understand the depth of the grace of God if you get that statement? That the reason God didn't just pour out his wrath on Jesus, but it was his good pleasure to do so was because he knew it was the only way to save you and I. Because do you understand? I mean, that should blow your mind that he was willing to put his own son through all of that because he saw what, he knows what's coming. All of this rebellion must be dealt with. For you to come back into the presence that we once had in relationship with each other in the garden, I, ha- I cannot allow that to happen without somehow dealing with your sin. And so I, it, I, I want to deal with it. I want so desperately to deal with it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become incarnate flesh and I'm going to come down here and live among you pigs so that I can die for you pigs because that's how much I love you. Guys, when we look at what we just saw in Revelation chapter, our question shouldn't be, I don't, our, our thing shouldn't be, I don't want any part of that God. Our thing should be, I don't want any part of what's about to happen. And there's only one way of escape. Guys, we don't have a sin problem. We don't. Humanity, sin is a symptom. It is. We have a worship problem. We worship us. We just do. We have an awe problem. We have lost the awe of the grace of God because we've lost our need for it. Man, I'm just better than that dude, so why do I need Jesus? So that causes us to lose our awe of the grace, which, which then causes us not to worship God because well, I don't really need him in my life. That's the sin problem. Stop fighting your sin issue and just fall back in love with Jesus Christ. Just, just get back to the awe of God. And if, and if you have nothing else to be in awe, awe about, be in awe that it was his good pleasure to crush his son because he knew what was coming if he didn't. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the truth that you love us enough not to give us what we want. Because you know what that'll make us? Spoiled brats. And we see evidence of that all around us and even in our own lives as believers. We are in a war, and it is a war for worship. We are either going to worship the God who spoke the stars into creation and called us to him out of the darkness and into the light, or we are going to worship ourselves. That's it. And when we do that, we are are the ones putting the gap between us. And, And yet, Lord... You know, you know all that? And, and so, from the beginning, you said, I am going to send a Redeemer. I'm going to send your only hope. And it's going to be my son, me in the flesh. And because your sin is so great, his suffering is going to be massive. I'm, I'm imagining even now that when, when, when you guys were talking about it up in the heavenlies and, and, and Jesus said, give it to me, Dad. I'll take all of it. I can imagine you saying to him, 
Son, I just need you to know. If I'm going to spare them, I will not spare you. And he came anyway. I am in awe. In Jesus' name. Amen.